Good afternoon everybody, I'm Robert from El Magnifico Games and today we are going to continue with our normal Wednesday Poetry, Prose and Riddles stream. Now last week we finished on the poem On the Morning of Christ's Nativity by John Milton. To put it concisely, this poem is beyond my analytical skills at this point. There's really not much I can usefully say on the subject. So, given that, and given the fact that I suspect the same will be true of the other John Milton poems in this anthology, I suggest that we try and move through them quickly. It does seem a bit of a shame, given what a what a well-regarded poet he was, and given the influence that he clearly had, um, but there's not really much else I can do, because, as I say, it's rather beyond me. So, with that said, we will begin, as we do all weeks, by rereading the last poem that we looked at the week before 
Then we will move on to the sub to subsequent poems that we haven't seen yet, but in this case I will keep the analysis to a minimum until we move past John Milton. So, on the morning of Christ's nativity, this is the month and this is the happy morn, wherein the Son of Heaven's eternal King, of wedded maid and virgin mother born, a great redemption from above did bring. For so the holy sages once did sing, that he our deadly forfeit should release, and with his father work us to a perpetual peace. A glorious form, that light unsufferable, and that far-beaming blaze of majesty, wherewith he wont at heaven's high council table to sit the midst of trinal unity, he laid aside, and here with us to be, forsook the courts of everlasting day, and chose with us a darksome house of mortal clay. Say, heavenly muse, shall not thy sacred vein afford a present to the infant god? Hast thou no verse, no hymn, or solemn strain to welcome him to this his new abode? Now while the heaven, by the sun's team untrod, have took no print of the approaching light, and all the spangled hosts keep watch in the squadrons bright, see how from far upon the eastern road the star-led wizards haste with odours sweet. Oh, run, prevent them with thy humble ode, and lay it lowly at his blessed feet. Have thou the honour first thy lord to greet, and join thy voice unto the angel choir, and from his secret altar, touched with hallowed fire? It was the winter wild, while the heaven-born child, all meanly wrapped in rude manger lies, nature in awe to him, had duffed her gaudy trim, with her great master so to sympathise. It was no season then for her, to wanton with the sun her lusty paramour, only with speeches fair she woos the gentle air to hide her guilty front with innocent snow, and on her naked shame pollute with sinful blame the saintly veil of maiden white to throw. Confounded that her maker's eyes should look so near upon her foul deformities, but he, her fears to cease, sent down the meek-eyed peace. She crowned with olive green came softly sliding down through the turning sphere, his ready harbinger with turtle wing the amorous clouds dividing, and waving wide her myrtle wand, she strikes a universal peace through sea and land. No war or battle sound was heard the world around, the idle spear and shield were high uphung, the hooked chariot stood, unstained with hostile blood, the trumpet spake not to the armed throng, and king sat still with awful eye, and if they surely knew their sovereign lord was by. But peaceful was the night, wherein the Prince of Light, his reign of peace upon the earth began, the winds with wonder whist, smoothly the waters kissed, whispering new joys to the mild ocean, who now have quite forgot to rave, while birds of calm sit brooding on the charmed wave, the stars with deep amaze, stand fixed in the steadfast gaze, bending one way their precious influence, and will not take their flight, for all the morning light, or Lucifer that often warned them he thence, but in their glimmering orbs did glow, until the Lord himself bespake and bid them go. And, though the shady gloom had given day her room, the sun himself withheld his wanton, wanted speed, and hid his head for shame, as his inferior flame the new enlightened world no more should need. He saw a greater sun appear than his bright throne or burning axle-tree could bear. The shepherds on the lawn, or earth, or air, the point of dawn, that simply chatting in a rustic row, for little thought they then, for, sorry, for little thought they than that the mighty Pan was kindly come to live with them below. Perhaps their loves, or else their sheep, was all that did their silly thought so busy keep. When such music sweet, their hearts and ears did greet, as never was by mortal finger struck, divinely warbled voice answering the stringed noise, as all their souls in blissful rapture took. The air such pleasure loth to lose, with thousand echoes still prolongs each heavenly close. Nature that heard such sound, beneath the hollow round of Cynthia's seat, the airy region of thrilling, now was almost one. To think a part was done, and that a rain had here its last fulfilling, she knew such harmony alone could hold all heaven and earth in happier union. At last, around their sight, a globe of circular light that with long beams the shame faced night arrayed, the helmed Cherubim, sorry, the helmed cherubim and sordid seraphim are seen in glittering ranks with wings displayed, 
harping in loud and solemn choir with unexpressive notes to heaven's newborn air. Such music, as tis said, before was never made, but when of old the sons of morning sung, while the creator, while the creator great his constellations sat, and the well-balanced world on hinges hung, and cast a dark foundation deep, and bid the weltering waves their oozy channel keep, ring out, ye crystal spheres, once bless our human ears, if ye have power to touch our senses so, and let your silver chime move in melodious time, and let the bass of heaven's deep organ blow, and with your ninefold harmony make up full consort to the angelic symphony. For if such a holy song enwrap our fancy long, time will run back and fetch the age of gold, and speckled vanity will sicken soon and die, and leprous sin will melt from earthly mould, and hell itself will pass away, and leave the dolorous mansions to the peering day. You truth and justice, then, will down return to men, orbed in rainbow and like glories wearing. Mercy will sit between, throned in celestial sheen, with radiant feet the tissued clouds down steering, and heaven, as at some festival, will open wide the gates of her high palace hall. But wisest fate says, says no, this must not yet be so. The babe lies yet in smiling infancy that on the bitter cross must redeem our loss, and so both himself and us to glorify, yet first to those chained in sleep, the wakeful trump of doom must thunder through the deep, with such a horrid clang, as on Mount Sinai rang, while the red fire and smouldering clouds outbreak, the aged earth aghast with terror of that blast, shall from the surface to the centre shake, when at the world's last sensation, sorry, when at the world's last session, the dreadful judge in the middle air shall spread his throne, and then at last our bliss, full and perfect is, but now begins. For from his happy day, the old dragon underground, in straighter limits bound, not half so far cast his usurped sway, and, wroth to see his kingdom fail, swings the scaly horror of his folded tail. The oracles are dumb, no voice or hideous hum, runs through the arched roof in words deceiving. Apollo from his shrine can no more divine, with hollow shriek the steep of Delphos leaving. No nightly trance or breathed spell inspires the pale-eyed priest from the prophetic cell, the lonely mountains o'er, and the resounding shore, a voiceless weeping heard and loud lament from haunted spring and dale, edged with poplar pale, the parting geniuses with the sighting, sighing scent, with Flower in woven tresses torn, the nymphs in twilight shade of tangled thickets mourn. In consecrated earth and on the holy hearth, the lars and lemurs moan with midnight plaint. In urns and altars round, a drear and dying sound. A frights of flamens at their service quaint, and the chill marble seems to sweat, while each peculiar power forgoes his wanted seat. Pioran Balim forsake their temples dim with twice with the with that twice battered god of Palestine and mooned Ashtaroth heaven's queen and mother both now sit not girt with tapers holy shrine sorry with tapers holy shine the limbic Hamon shrieks his horn in vain the Tyrian maids their wounded Thamuz mourn and sudden Moloch fled have left in shadows dread his burning idol all of blackest hue, in vain with symbols ring they call the grisly king, in dismal dance about the furnace blue, the brutish gods of Nile as fast, Isis and Horus, and the dog Anubis haste, nor is Osiris seen, in Memphian grove or green, trampling the unshowered grass with lowings loud, nor can he be at rest within his sacred chest, nor but profoundish hell can be his shroud, in vain with timbered, with timbreled anthems dark, the sable-stilled sorcerers bear his worshipped ark, he feels from Judah's land, the dreaded infant's hand, the rays of Bethlehem blind his dusky eyne, for all the gods beside, longer dare abide, nor typhon huge ending in snaky twine, a babe to shrew his godhead true, can in his swaddling bands control the damned crew. So when the sun in bed, cut curtained with cloudy red, pillows his chin upon an orient wave, the flocking shadows pale, troop to the infernal jail, each fettered ghost slips to his severed grave, 
and their yellow skirted fays fly after the night seas, leaving their moon loved maze. But see, the virgin blessed has laid her babe to rest. Time is our tedious song sh should here have ending. Heaven's youngest teamed star have fixed her polished car. Her sleeping lord with handmade lamp attending, and all about the courtly stable, bright harnessed angels sit in order serviceable. So that was on the night of Christ's nativity. Sorry, on the morning of Christ's nativity, I should have said. So, that was the last poem we looked at last week. As I said before, I am fairly certain that Milton's poetry is going to be beyond me. So, I'm going to skip most of the analysis and just quickly go through the rest of Milton's poetry in this anthology. So, the next one is Le Allegro. Hence loathed melancholy, of Cerberus and black as midnight born, in Stygian cave forlorn, Amongst horrid shapes and shrieks and sights unholy, find out some uncouth cell where brooding darkness spreads his jealous wings and the night raven sings. There, under ebon shades and low browed rocks, as ragged as thy locks, in dark. Chimurian, perhaps? Chimurian. In dark Chimurian desert ever dwell. I don't know that, by the way, I may be mispronouncing it, that's my best guess. In dark Cimmerian desert ever dwell, but come, thou goddess fair and free, in heaven slept, you frocine, and by men heart-easing mirth, whom lovely Venus at a birth, with two sister graces more, to ivy-crowned Bacchus bore, or whether as some sages sing, the frolic wind that breathes the spring, Zephyr the aurora playing, as he met her once a maying, there on beds of violets blue, and fresh blown roses washed in dew, filled her with thee a daughter's fair, so buxom, blithe, and debonair. That's probably meant to be lithe, I'd have thought. Um, I've noticed a few what look to be spelling errors. Um, or typos. Anyway. So buxom, blithe, and debonair, haste thee, nymph, and bring with thee, jest and youthful Jollity, quips and cranks and wanton wiles, nods and becks and wreathed smiles, such as hang on Habe's cheek, and love to live in dimpled sleek, sport that wrinkled care derides, and laughter holding both his sides, come and trip it as you go on the light fantastic toe, and in thy right hand lead with thee the mountain nymph's sweet liberty, and if I give thee honour due, Murph admit of me Murph admit me of thy crew to live with her and live with thee in unreproved pleasures free to hear the lark begin his flight and singing startled the dull night from his watchtower in the skies till the dampled dawn doth rise then to come in spite of sorrow and at my window bid good to good morrow through the sweet briar of the vine or the twisted eglantine while the cock with lively din scatters the rear of darkness thin, and to the stack or the barn door stoutly struts his dames before, of listening how the hounds and horn cheerly rouse the slumbering morn from the side of some hoar hill, through the high wood echoing shrill, sometime walking not unseen by hedge hedgerow elms on hillocks green, right against the eastern gate where the great sun begins his stay, robed in flames and amber light, clouds in fells and liveries dight, while the ploughman near at hand whistles over the furrowed land, and the milkmaid singeth blithe, perhaps it is meant to be blithe, um, and the mower wets his scythe, and every shepherd tells his tale under the hawthorn in the dale, straight mine eye have caught new pleasures, Whilst the landscape round it measures, russet lawns and fallows grey, where the nibbling flocks do stray, mountains on whose barren breast the labouring clouds do often rest, meadows trim with daisies pied, 
shallow brooks and rivers wide, towers and battlement it sees, bosomed high in tufted trees, where perhaps some beauty lies, the sinosure of neighbouring eyes, hard by a cottage chimney smokes from betwixt two aged oaks, where Corridon and Thyrosis uh, met, are at that savoury dinner set, of herbs and other country messes, which the neat-handed Phyllis dresses, and then in haste her bower she leaves, with Thessilis, Thessilis, sorry, with, with Thessilis to bind the sheaves, or if the earlier season lead, to the tanned haycock in the mead, sometimes with secure delight, the upland hamlets will invite, when the merry bells ring round, and the jocund red beck sound, to many a youth and many a maid, dancing in the chequered shade, and young and old come forth to play on a sunshine holiday, till the live long daylight fail, then to the spicy nut brown ale, with stories told of many a feat, how fairy Mab the junkets eat, she was pinched and pulled, she said, and he, by friar's lantern led, tells how the drudging goblin sweat, to earn his cream bowl duly set, when in one night a glimpse of morn, his shadowy flail have freshed the corn, that ten day labourers could not end, then lies him down the lumber fiend, and stretched out all the chimney's length, basks at the fire his hairy strength, and crop full out of doors he flings, o'er the first cock his martin rings, sorry, matin rings, Thus done the tales, to bed they creep, by whispering winds soon lulled asleep. Towered cities please us then, and the busy hum of men, where throngs of knights and barons bold, and weed of peace high triumph hold, with store of ladies whose bright eyes reign influence and judge the prize of wit or arms, while both contend to win her grace, whom all commend. There let Hymen oft appear, in saffron robe with taper clear, and pomp and feast and revelry, with mask and antique pageantry, such sights as youthful poets dream on summer ease by haunted stream, then to the well trod stage anon, if Johnson's learned sock be on, or sweetest Shakespeare fancies child, warble his native wood notes wild, and ever against eating cares, let me in soft Lydian airs, married to immortal verse such as the meeting soul may pierce, in notes with many a winding bout of linked sweetness, long drown out, with wanton heed and giddy cunning, the melting voice through mazes running, and twisting all the chains that tie the hidden soul of harmony, the Orpheus self may heave his head from golden slumber on a bed of heaped Elysian, Elysian, of heaped Elysian flowers, and hear such strains as would have won the ear, of pluted to of quiet set free, his half regained. Eurydice, these delights, if thou canst give, mirth with thee I mean to live. So, that was Le Allegro. Blythe is casually careless or indifferent, showing a lack of concern. She had a blithe disregard of cultures outside the United States. Um, that's a Wiktionary's example. Uh, and chiefly in Scotland, elsewhere dated or literary, cheerful or happy. Um, so yeah, again, most of this is beyond me, so I'm not going to attempt a detailed analysis. Uh, yep, it has a complex structure.
there's very obvious rhyming. Usually with the next line where there is one, so they're forming pairs. Um, a very quick look, I can't detect a, a consistent number of syllables per line. There is a tendency towards eight, but it varies quite a lot. I think... hold on. Yeah, I think there's some... a, a strong tendency towards it being iambic. For example, uh, at the top of the page as currently displayed, in saffron robe with taper clear. That's iambic tetrameter. So yeah, I, uh, the most I can say is yes there is light rhyming. It seems to be a loose iambic. Uh, it seems to be composed of uh, a loose iambic meter but there is uh, it doesn't seem to have a fixed number of syllables per line. Now this may in fact be following a very well defined form that I'm just not aware of. Um, but that's about all I can say. So, moving on. We have Il Penseroso. You know, I probably should have been looking up what these uh, actually mean. I've got a feeling Allegro might mean something like speed or fast because I think it's used in music. Uh, a tempo marking directing oh, a tempo mark directing that passages to be played in a quick lively tempo faster than Allegretto but slower than Presto. Uh, more traditionally that a passage is to be played in a lively or happy manner, not necessarily quickly. Huh. Fair enough. And... Penseroso, which I'm probably mispronouncing. Pensive, thoughtful. So, Il Penseroso, which as I say, I'm almost certainly mispronouncing. Hence, vain deluding joys, the brood of folly without father bread, how little you bested, or filled the fixed mind with all your toys, dwell in some idle brain, and fancies fond with gaudy shapes possess as thick and numberless as the gay mots that people the sunbeams are like his hovering dreams the fickle pensioners of the morpheus train but hail thou goddess sage and holy hail divinest melancholy whose saintly visage is too bright to hit the sense of human sight and therefore to our weaker view overlaid with black said wisdom's hue black but such as in esteem prince Memnon's sister might be seen, or that starred Ethiop queen that strove to set her beauty's praise above, the sea nymphs and their powers offended, yet thou art higher far descended, the bright haired Vesta long of yore to solitary Saturn bore, his daughter she in Saturn's reign, such a mixture was not held a stain, often glimmering bowers and glades, he met her and in secret shade, sorry, in secret shades, of woody Ida's inmost grove, or yet there was no fear of Jove, come pensive none, devout and pure, sombre steadfast and demure, all in a robe of darkest grain, flowing with majestic train, and sable stole of cypress lawn, over thy decent shoulder drawn, 
can but keep thy wonted state with even step amusing gait, and looks commencing with the skies, thy rapt soul sitting in thine eyes, there held in holy passion still, forget thyself to marble, till with a sad leaden downward cast they'll fix them on the earth as fast, and join with thee come peace and quiet, spare fast that oft with gods doth diet, and hear the muses in a ring, I round about Jove's altar sing, and add to these retired leisure that in trim gardens takes his pleasure, but first and chiefest with thee bring him that yon soars on the golden wing, guiding the fiery willed throne, the cherub contemplation, and the mute silence hissed along, lest, Pil lest Philomel will dine a song in the sweetest, saddest plight, soothing the rugged brow of night, while Cynthia checks her dragon yoke gently o'er the accustomed oak, sweet bird thee shunnest the noise of folly, is musical most melancholy, the chantress oft the woods among, I woo to hear thy even song, and missing thee I walk unseen, on the dry smooth shaven green, to beheld the wandering moon, riding near her highest noon, like one that has been led astray, through the heaven's wide pathless way, and oft, as if her head she bowed, Stooping through a fleecy cloud, oft on the plat of rising ground, I hear the far off curfew sound over some wide watered shore, swinging slow with sullen roar. Or if the air will not permit, some still removed place will fit, where glowing embers through the room teach light to counterfeit a gloom. Far from all resort of mirth, save the cricket on the hearth, or the bellman's drowsy charm to bless the doors from nightly harm. Or let my lamp at midnight hour be seen in some high lonely tower where I may oft out watch the bear with thrice great Hermes or unsphere the spirit of Plato to unfold that will to what vast regions hold the immortal mind that hath forsook her mansion in this fleshy nook and of those demons that are found in fire, air, flood or underground whose power hath a true consent with planet or with element some time let a gorgeous tragedy and scepted all comes sweeping by, presenting Thebes or Pelops line, or the tale of Troy divine, or what thou rare of later age, en ennobled hath the buskined stage, but O sad virgin, that thy power might raise the Musaeus from his bower, or bid the soul of Orpheus sing, such notes as warbled to the string. Drew iron tears down Pluto's crook cheek, And made hell grant that love did seek, Or call up him that left half told The story of Campuscan bold, Of Campbell and of Algar, Algar Saif, And who had Canas to wife, That owned the virtues ring and glass, And of the wondrous horse of brass, On which the Tartar king did ride, And if aught else great bards beside, In sage and solemn tunes have sung of tawnies and of trophies hung, of forest and enchantments drear, where more is meant that, than meets the ear. Thus night oft see me in thy pale career, till civil-suited moon appear. Not tricked and frounced, as she was wont, with the attic boy to hunt, but kerchiefed in a comely cloud, while rocking winds are piping loud, or ushered with the showers still, when the gust hath blown his fill. Ending on the rustling leaves with minute drops from off the eaves, and when the sun begins to fling his flaring beams, me goddess bring to arch walks of twilight groves and shadows brown that sylvan loves of pine or monumental oak, where the rude axe which heaved stroke was never heard the nymphs to daunt or fright them from their hallowed haunt there in close covert by some brook where no profaner eye may look, hide me from day's garish eye, while the bee with honeyed thigh, that at her flowery work doth sing, and the waters murmuring, with such concert as they keep, entice the dewy feathered sheep, sorry, entice the dewy feathered sleep, and let some strange mysterious dream, wave at his wings an airy stream, of lively portraiture displayed, softly on my eyelids laid, and as I wake, sweet music breathe, above, about, or underneath, sent by some spirit to mortal's good, or the unseen genius of the wood, 
But let my Jude feet never fail to walk the studious cloisters pale and love the high embowed roof with attic pillars massy proof and storied windows richly dight casting a dim religious light there let the pealing organ blow to the full voiced choir below and service high and anthems clear as as may with sweetness through mine ear dissolve me into ecstasies and bring all heaven before mine eyes and may at last my weary age find out the peaceful hermitage the hairy gown and mossy cell where i may sit and rightly spell of every star that heaven does shrew and every herb that sips a dew till old experience do attain to something like prophetic strain these pleasures melancholy give and i with thee will choose to live so that was il pen Seroso. Uh, and I with thee will choose to live. That's iambic pen, um, tetrameter. So, again, having looked through this, This might actually be all in iambic tetrameter. Uh, I'd have to look for it. Uh, a much more carefully to see if there's any significant exceptions. Ah, this is ten syllables. Sweet bird that shunnest the noise of folly. So yeah, it's not all tetrameter. That's not entirely iambic either, is it? Sweet bird that shunnest the noise of folly. No, hold on. S sweet bird that shunnest the noise of folly. Something's odd about that line. Is that trochaic? Is that trochaic pentameter? Sweet bird, no, it would be sweet bird that shunnest the noise of folly. I think that might be. Well, in any case, um, we can conclude as we did with the last poem that this is uh, loosely iambic tetrameter, but there are exceptions. I do not know whether um, this is following a specific form that is more strict that I don't know the name of or whether it is just loose uh, iambic tetrameter. Uh, there is rhyming and again it tends to be pairs of lines that rhyme. So, 
On to the next one. Lycidas. In this monody... Hello, what's a monody? An ode, as in Greek drama for a single voice, often specifically a mournful song or dirge. Any poem mourning the death of someone, an elegy. Monotonous or mournful noise. A composition having a single melodic line, although that's music. Okay. Um, in this monody, the author bewails a learned friend unfortunately drowned in his passage from Chester on the Irish Sea, 1637, and by occasion foretells the ruin of our corrupted clergy then in their height. Interesting. Bearing in mind that the editor that wrote that was writing that in the uh, very early 1900s. So that's post-Shakespeare, pre-English Civil War, I'm pretty sure. Uh, what was the precise date of the, well, I don't suppose there is a precise date, what was the rough date of the English Civil War? Yeah, uh, not considered to have begun till uh, 1642, although of course it's it is argued that there were several civil wars, but they all came. But it was really a case of, you know, there was some fighting, then there was a period of peace for like a year or two, then there was more fighting and so on. Um, but regardless, that's where it is in history. Is that indeed when. Uh, well, it must have been when uh, Milton was writing. Yeah, 1608 to 1674, that's when he was alive. Huh. Interesting. Anyway. So. Lycidas. Yet once more, O ye laurels, and once more, ye myrtle brown with ivy never sear, I come to pluck your berries harsh and crude, and with forced fingers rude, shatter your leaves before the mellowing year. Bitter constraint and sad occasion dear, compel me to disturb your season due, for Lycidas is dead, dead ere his prime, young Lycidas, and have not left his peer. Who would not sing for Lycidas, he knew, himself to sing and build the lofty rhyme. He must not float upon his watery beer. Unwept and welter to the parching wind, without the meed of some melodious tear, begin then, sisters of the sacred well, that from beneath the seat of Jove doth spring, begin and somewhat loudly sweep the thing, sorry, sweep the string. Hence, with denial vain and coy excuse, so may some gentle muse with lucky words favour my destined urn, and as he pass his turn, and bid fair peace be to my sable shroud. For we were nursed upon the self same hill, fed the same flock by fountain, shade and rill, together both, ere the high lawn appeared, under the opening eyelids of the morn, we drove afield and both together heard, that time the grey fly winds hurt sultry horn, battening our flocks with the fresh dews of night, off till the star that rose at evening bright, toward heaven's descent had sloped his westering wheel. Meanwhile the rural ditties were not mute, tempered to the oaten flute, rough satires danced and formed with cloven feel with cloven heel, from the glad sound would not be absent long, and old Demotus loved to hear our song, but oh the heavy change now thou art gone, now thou art gone and never must return. Thee shepherd, thee the woods and desert caves, with wild thyme and gadding vine o'ergrown, and all their echoes mourn, the willows and the hazel copses green, shall know no more be seen, 
fanning their joyous leaves to thy soft lays, as killing at the canker to the rose, or taint warm to the weanling herds that graze, or frost of flowers that their gay wardrobe wear, when first the white thorn blows, such lycidus they lost to shepherd's ear. Where were ye, nymphs, when the remorses deep closed o'er the head of your loved lycidus? For never were ye playing on the steep, where your old bards of famous druids lie, nor on the shaggy top of Mona High, nor yet where Diva spreads her wizard stream. I me, I fondly dream, had ye been there, for what could that have been? Had ye been there, for what could that have done? What could the muse herself that Orpheus bore, the muse herself for her enchanting son, whom universal nature did lament, when by the rout that made the hideous roar, his gory visage down the stream was sent, down the swift Hebrus to the lesbian shore? Alas, what boots it with incessant care to tend the homely, slighted shepherd's trade, and strictly meditate the thankless muse, were it not better done as others use, to sport with Amaryllis in the shade, or with the tangles of Nera's hair, famous as spur that the clear spirit doth raise, that last infirmity of noble mind, to scorn delights and live laborious days, but the fair Gurdon, when we hope to find, and to think to burst out into sudden blaze, comes the blind fury with abhorred shears, and slits a thin spun life, but not the praise. Phobus replied and touched my trembling ears, Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil, nor in the glistening foil, set off to the world, nor in broad rumours lies, but lives and spreads aloft by those pure eyes, and perfect witness of all judging Jove, and he pronounces lastly on each deed, of so much fame in heaven expect thy mead. O fountain Arethus, and thou honoured flood, smooth sliding Minicius, crowned with vocal reeds, that strained I heard was of a higher mood. And now my oak proceeds, and listens to the herald of the sea, that came in Neptune's plea, he asked the waves, and asked the felon winds, what hard m mishap hath doomed this gentle swain, and questioned every gust of rugged wings, that blows from off each beat promontory, they knew not of his story, and sage hippotades their answer brings, that not a blast was from his dungeon strayed, the air was calm and on the level brine, sleek panope with all her sisters played, it was that fatal and perfidious bark, built in the eclipse and rigged with curses dark, that sunk so low that sacred head of thine, next chemist Reverend Sire went footing slow, his mantle hairy and his bonnet sedge, inwrought with figures dim and on the edge, like to what sanguine flowers inscribed with woe. Ah, who hath reft, quoth he, my dearest pledge, last came and last did go, the pilot of the Galian lake, Gal Gal Galilean, sorry, the pilot of the Galilean lake, to massy keys he bore of metal strain, the golden opes. The golden opes? The golden opes, the iron shuts amain. He shook his metered locks and stern bespake. How well could I have sparred for thee, young swain? I know of such as, for their belly's sake, creep and intrude and climb into the fold of other care little reckoning make. Then how to scramble at the shearer's feast and shove away the worthy bidden guest blind mouths that scarce themselves know how to hold a sheep book or have learned aught else the least that to the faithful herdsman's art belongs what wrecks it them that that what need they they are sped and when they list their lean and flashy songs great on their scrannel pipes of wretched straw the hungry sheep look up and are not fed but swollen with wind and the rank mist they draw Rot inwardly, and foul contagion spread, Beside what the grim wolf with privy paw, Daily devours a pace, and nothing said, But that two-handed engine at the door, uh, Stands ready to smite once, and smite no more, Return, Alpheus, the dread voice is past, That shrunk thy streams, return, Sicilian muse, And call the veils, and bid them hither cast, Their bells and flowerets of a thousand hues, Ye valleys low, where the 
mild whispers use of shades and wanton winds and gushing brooks, of whose fresh lap the swart star sparsely looks, throw hither all your quaint enamelled eyes, that on the green turf suck the honeyed showers, and purple the ground with vernal flowers, bring the wrath primrose that forsaken dies, the tufted croto and pale jessamine. The, pink, the white pink and the pansy freak with jet, the glowing violet, the musk rose, and the well attired woodbine, the cowslips one that hang the pensive head, and every flower that sad embroidery wears, bid Amaranthus all his beauty shed, and daffodillies fill their cups with tears. Um, to sh Drew the laureate hearse where Lysid lies, for so to interpose a little ease. Let her frail fort daily with false surmise. I me was thee the shores and sounding seas, was far away where thy bones are hurled, whether beyond the stormy Hebrides, where thou perhaps under the whelming tide visitest the bottom of the monstrous world, or whether thou to our moist vales denied. Sleepest by the fable of Belarus old, where the great vision of the guarded mount looks towards Namancus and Bayona's hold. Look homeward, angel, now and melt with Ruth, uh, and, O oh, ye dolphins, waft the hapless youth, weep no war, weep no more, woeful shepherds, weep no more, for Lysidas your sorrow is not dead. Sunk though he is beneath the watery floor, so sinks the day star in the ocean bed, and yet anon repairs his drooping head, and tricks his beams, and with new spangled ore, flames in the foreground of the morning sky, so lid has sunk low, but mounted high, through the dear might of him that walked the waves, where other groves and other streams along, with nectar pure his oozy locks he laves, and hears the unexpressive nuptial song, in the blessed kingdom's meek of joy and love, there entertain him all the saints above, in solemn troops and sweet societies that sing and singing in their glory move, and wipe the tears for ever from his eyes. Now Lysidas the shepherds weeps no more. Henceforth thou art the genius of the shore, in thy large recompense and shalt be good to all that wander in the perilous flood. Thus sang the uncouth swain to the oaks and rills, while the still morn went out with sandals grey. He touched the tender stops of various quills, with eager thought warbling his Doric lay, and now the sun had stretched out all the hills, and now was dropped into the western bay. At last he rose and twitched his mantle blue, tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. So again, we... Actually, no, there is a slightly more complex roaming scheme here. Sometimes they form pairs, sometimes they form A, B, A, B structures. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, I think this is iambic pentameter. Yep. There entertain him all the saints above, or tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new, or at last he rose and twitched his mantle blue. This is iambic pentameter. So, yep. Um, again, I'm not really knowledgeable enough to be more precise than that, but there is end rhyming. Looks like it tends to form simple structures, either coming in pairs or following an ABAB -A -B structure, and it appears this is written in iambic pentameter. Um, so, that was Lysidus. And finally, that is the final poem by John Milton in this anthology is On His Blindness. So, On His Blindness. 
when I consider how my life is spent, uh, half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent, which is deaf to hide, lodged with me, useless through my soul more bent, to serve therewith my maker and present, my true account, lest he returning chide, doth God exact day labour, like denied, I fondly ask, but patience to prevent, that murmur soon replies, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best, his state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post o'er land and ocean without rest, and they also serve who only stand and wait. So, uh, I think we can do a slightly more thorough analysis of this one. Are there any words that we don't know or would like discussed or we want to draw attention to? I don't think I see any. If there's any that uh, anyone in chat sees, please leave a comment. Um, so, I can plainly see that this is iambic pentameter, so it's a weak syllable followed by a strong syllable repeated five times, so ten syllables per line each. Let's see, we have spent and bent and wide and hide, so that's A, B, B, A present, prevent, chide and deny, so again A, B, B, A, need, speed, best and, best and state, no it's best and rest, state and weight, need and speed, that's an odd structure, A, B, C, A, B, C. A, B, C, A, B, C. Huh. I don't remember coming across an A, B, C, A, B, C rhyming structure before. But there we are. So that covers the meter and that covers rhyme. So I guess the only thing left to discuss is its meaning. So I will move on to the final reading of this poem um, and then afterwards we will briefly discuss its meaning uh, if you have anything to say on the subject then please by all means leave a comment in chat and I'll read it once I have uh, completed the final reading so on his blindness when I consider how my light is spent uh, half my days in this dark world and wide and that one talent which is deaf to hide, lodged with me useless through my soul more bent, to serve therewith my maker and present, my true account lest he returning chide, doth God exact day labour like denied, I fondly ask, but patience to prevent, that murmur soon replies, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts, who best bears his mild yoke, they serve him best, his state is kingly, thousands at his bidding, speed and post, o'er land and ocean without rest, they also serve who only stand and wait. So my interpretation of that, which may be wrong, is since the poem is entitled On His Blindness, I assume this is dealing with the... Um,
the um, disability of blindness. I, I one wonders if perhaps Milton went was going blind in his old age or something like that, um, because that would of course rendered someone illiterate, and for someone of letters that would be particularly distressing. Um, so I think what the poem is more or less saying is that I have one talent, that with words, or that with the written word, and yet I'm losing my eyesight. Um, so why, God, do you deny me my ability to do labour? You know, the one thing I can do well, you seem to be robbing me of the ability to do. Um, and then God's reply is that he doesn't need man's work. He is God. He has many beings at his beck and call to do his work. And uh, they will uh, serve him. And they will also serve those who only stand and wait, which I think refers to those that have gotten on in life to the point that they aren't able to work anymore and are waiting for the inevitable, shall we put it. That's the best I can make sense of it. I may be wrong, but uh, I think that's what the poem is saying. So, unless we have anything uh, more we'd like to discuss about this poem, I think we will move on to Pride and Prejudice. As usual, I will begin by recapping what we had read last week. So, in chapter 49, an express arrived from Mr. Bennett from Mr. Gardner. In this letter, Mr. Gardner indicates that while Lydia is not yet married to Mr. Wickham, they could be very soon if only Mr. Bennett would assure Lydia, by settlement, of her equal share of the £5,000 set aside in anticipation of Mr. and Mrs. Bennett's passing and during his life of £100 per annum. The letter also spoke of Mr. Wickham having, contrary to popular opinion, some little money left over even after discharging his debts. Mr. Bennett does not believe this, especially as someone as mercenary as Mr. Wickham would not marry on so slight a temptation as 100 a year, and thus concludes that Mr. Gardiner must have settled Mr. Wickham's death, debts at no small personal expense to bring about this happy, happy circumstance. Mrs. Bennett, upon receiving news that Lydia will be married, promptly forgets all memory of Lydia's earlier misconduct. In chapter 50, the good news spreads quickly through the house and with proportionate speed through the neighbourhood. Shortly, Mr. Bennett makes it clear to Mrs. Bennett that he would not encourage the impotence of the newlyweds by ever receiving them at Longbourn again. Mrs. Bennett can hardly comprehend it, that his anger could be carried to such a point of inconceivable resentment as to refuse his daughter a privilege without which her marriage would scarcely seem valid, exceeded all she could believe. Mr. Gardner wrote again to Mr. Bennett, mainly to inform him that Mr. Wickham had resolved on quitting the militia and joining the regulars, and that as a consequence Lydia and Mr. Wickham would be moving to the north. Jane and Elizabeth urged their father so earnestly, yet so rationally and mildly, to receive Lydia and her husband at Longbourn before she sets off for, nor for the north, that he was prevailed on to think as they thought and to act as they wished. so he was convinced. In chapter 51, after the wedding, the couple were received in Longbourn, where it quickly became apparent that Lydia was still untamed, unabashed, wild, noisy and fearless. Wickham was not at all more distressed than herself. Elizabeth and Mr. Bennet found the visit particularly distressing given the newlyweds' impudent gaiety. Towards the end of the visit, Lydia lets it slip to... sorry, Lydia lets it slip to Elizabeth and Jane that Mr. Darcy was in attendance at her wedding, but that she had already promised her secrecy on the subject. Elizabeth was 
left in utter amazement and with a burning curiosity. Hastily, she seized a sheet of paper and wrote a short letter to her aunt to request an explanation of what Liddy had dropped, if it were compatible with the secrecy which had been intended. So that's where we left off last week. Chapter 52 Elizabeth had the satisfaction of receiving an answer to a letter as soon as she possibly could. She was no sooner in possession of it than hurrying into the little copse, where she was least likely to be interrupted, she sat down on one of the benches and prepared to be happy, for the length of the letter convinced her that it did not contain a denial. Gracechurch Street, September 6th. My dear niece, I have just received your letter and I shall devote this whole morning to answering it as I foresee that a little writing will not comprise what I have to tell you. I must confess myself surprised by your application. I did not expect it from you. Don't think me angry, however, for I only mean to let you know that I had not imagined such inquiries to be necessary on your side. If you do not choose to understand me, forgive my impertinence. Your uncle is as much surprised as I am, and nothing but the belief of your being a party concerned would have allowed him to act as he has done. But if you are really innocent and ignorant, I must be more explicit. On the very day of my coming home from Longbourn, your uncle had a most unexpected visitor. Mr Darcy called and was shut up with him several hours. It was all over before I arrived, so my curiosity was not so dreadfully racked as yours seems to have been. He came to tell Mr Gardner that he had found out where your sister and Mr Wickham were, and that he had seen and talked with them both. Wickham repeatedly, Lydia once. From what I can collect, he left Derbyshire only one day after ourselves, and came to town with the resolution of hunting for them. The motive professed was his conviction of it being owing to himself that Wickham's worthlessness had not been so well known as to make it impossible for any young woman of character to love or confide in him. He generously imputed the whole to his mistaken pride, and confessed that he had before thought it beneath him to lay his private actions open to the world. His character was to speak for itself, he called it, sorry, was to speak for itself. He called it, therefore, his duty to step forward and endeavour to remedy an evil which had been brought on by himself. If he had another motive, I'm... If he had another motive, I am sure it would never disgrace him. He had, he had been some days in town before he was able to discover them, but he had something direct in his search, which was more than we had and the consciousness of this was another reason for his resolving to follow us. There is a lady, it seems, a Mrs. Young, who was some time ago governess to Miss Darcy, and was dismissed from her charge on some cause of disapprobation, though he did not say that what. She then took a large house in Edward Street, has maintained herself by letting lodgings. This Mrs. Young was, he knew, intimately acquainted with Wickham, and he went to her for intelligence of him as soon as he got in, got to town, but it was two or three days before he could get from her what he wanted. She would not betray her trust, I suppose, without bribery and corruption, for she really didn't know where her friend was to be found. Wickham indeed had gone to her on the first, on his first arrival in London, and had she been able to receive him into a house, they would have taken up their abode with her. At length, however, a kind friend procured the wished for direction. They were in Dash Dash Street. He saw Wickham and afterwards insisted on seeing Lydia. His first object with her, he acknowledged, had been to persuade her to quit her present disgraceful situation and return to, his, to her friends as soon as they could be prevailed on to receive her, offering his assistance as far as it would go. He found Lydia absolutely resolved on remaining where she was. She cared for none of her friends. She wanted no help of his. She, she would not hear of leaving Wickham. She was sure they should be married some time or other, and it did not much signify when. Since such were her feelings, it only remained, he thought, to secure and expedite a marriage, which, in his first conversation with Wickham, he easily learnt had never been his design. He confessed himself obliged to leave the regiment on account of some debts of honour, of honour, which were very pressing, and scrupled not to lay all the ill consequences of Lydia's flight on her own folly alone. He meant to resign his commission immediately, 
and as to his future situation, he could conjecture very little about it. He must go somewhere, but he did not know where, and he knew he should have nothing to live on. Mr. Darcy asked him why he had not married your sister at once. Though, Miss Be though Mr. Bennet was not imagined to be very rich, he would have been able to do something for him, and his situation must have been benefited by marriage. But he found in reply to this question that Wickham still cherished the hope of more effectually making his fortune by marriage in some other country. Um, when they say country here, uh, they quite likely mean county. It seems that in this time, uh, country had a broader meaning than it does uh, today. It doesn't necessarily mean nation. Under such circumstances, however, he was not likely to be proof against the temptation of immediate relief. They met several times, for there was much to be discussed. Wickham, of course, wanted more than he could get, but length was reduced to be reasonable. Everything being settled between them, Mr. Darcy's next step was to make your uncle acquainted with it, and he first called in Gracechurch Street that evening before I came home, but Mr. Gardner would not be seen, and Mr. Darcy found on further inquiry that your father was still with him, but would quit town the next morning. He did not judge your father to be a person whom he could so properly com consult as your uncle, and therefore readily postponed seeing him till after the p departure of the former. He did not leave his name until the next day it was only known that a gentleman had called on business. On Saturday he came again. Your father was gone, your uncle at home, and as I said before, they had a great deal of a deal of talk together. They met again on Sunday, and then our, I saw him too. It was not at all settled before Monday. As soon as it was, the express was sent off to Longbourn, but our visitor was very obstinate. I fancy, Lizzie, that obstinacy, obst, that obstinacy, obstinancy, sorry. I fancy, Lizzie, that obstinancy is the real defect of his character after all. He's been accused of many faults at different times, but this is a true one. Nothing was to be done that he did not do himself. Though I am sure, and I do not speak it to be thanked, therefore say nothing about it. Your uncle would most readily have settled the whole. They battled it together for a long time, which was more than either the, either the gentleman or lady concerned in it deserved. But at last your uncle was forced to yield, and instead of being able, allowed to be of use to his niece, was for, forced to put up with only having the probable credit of it, which went sorely against the grain. And I really believe your letter this morning gave him great pleasure, because it required an explanation that would rob him of his borrowed feathers and give the praise where it was due. But Lizzie, this must go no further than yourself, or Jane at most. You know pretty well, I suppose, what has been done for the young people. His debts are to be paid, amounting, I believe, to considerably more than a thousand pounds. Uh, another thousand in addition to her own settled upon her, and this commission purchased. The reason why all this was to be done by him alone was such as I have given above. It was owing to him, to his reserve and want of proper consideration, that Wickham's character had been so misunderstood, and consequently that he had been received and noticed as he was. Perhaps there was some truth in this, though I doubt whether his reserve or anybody's reserve can be answerable for the event. But in spite of all this fine talking, my dear Lizzie, you may rest perfectly assured that your uncle would never have yielded if he had not given him credit for another interest in the affair. When all this was resolved on, he returned again to his friends, who were still staying at Pembley. It was agreed that he should be in London once more when the wedding took place, and all the money matters were then to receive the last finish. I believe I have now told you everything. It is a relation which you tell me is to give you great surprise. I hope at least it will not afford you any displeasure. Lydia came to us, and Wickham had constant admission to the house. He was exactly what he had been when I knew him in Hertfordshire, but I would not tell you how little I was satisfied with her behaviour while uh, she stayed with us. If it had not, if it had not, sorry, if I had not perceived by Jane's letter last Wednesday that her conduct on coming home was exactly of a piece with it, and therefore what I now tell you can give you no fresh pain. I talked to her repeatedly in the most serious manner, representing to her all the wickedness of what she had done, and all the unhappiness she had brought on her family. If she heard me, it was by good luck, for I am sure she did not listen. I was sometimes quite provoked, but then I recollected my dear Elizabeth and Jane, and for their sakes had patience with her. 
Mr. Darcy was punctual in his return, and as Lydia informed you, attended the wedding. He dined with us the next day, and was to leave town again on Wednesday or Thursday. Will you be very angry with me, my dear Lizzie, if I take the opportunity of saying what I've never... What I was never bold enough to say before, how much I liked him. His behaviour to us has, in every respect, been as pleasing as when we were in Derbyshire. His understanding and opinions all please me. He wants nothing but a little more liveliness. And that, if he marry prudently, his wife may teach him. I thought him very sly. He hardly ever mentioned your name, but slyness seems the fashion. Pray forgive me if I have, if I have been very presuming. Or at least do not punish me so far as to exclude me from P. What's that an abbreviation of? Pray forgive me if I've been very presuming. Or at least do not punish me so far as to exclude me from P. The only P I can think of would be Pemberley, where Mr. Darcy lives, but that doesn't make sense. I shall never be quite happy till I've been all round the park. A low phaeton with a nice little pair of ponies would be the very thing. Okay, so she's teasing her about how much uh, uh, between... she's Mrs. Gardner is teasing Elizabeth about... Um, her relationship with Mr. Darcy because she clearly presumes that they are going to get married um, and so that P presumably is Pemberley but by abbreviating it it makes it more tactful um, and a phaeton of course is a uh, type of carriage but I must write no more the children have been waiting me this half hour yours very sincerely M. Gardner. The contents of this letter threw Elizabeth into a flutter of spirits in which it was difficult to determine whether pleasure or pain, sorry, whether pleasure or pain bore the greatest share. The vague and unsettled suspicions which uncertainty had reduced of what Mr. Darcy might have been doing to forward her sister's match, which she had feared to encourage as an exertion of goodness too great to be probable, and at the same time dreaded to be just, from the pain of obligation, were proved beyond the greatest extent to be true. He had followed them purpose, uh, purposely to town. He had taken on himself all the trouble and mortification attended on such a research, in which supplication had been necessary to a woman whom he must, who he must abominate and despise. Abominate. Does that mean find abominable? To feel disgust towards, to loathe or detest, thoroughly to hate in the highest degree, as with religious dread. Interesting. And where he was reduced to meet, frequently meet, reason with, persuade, and finally bribe the man whom he always most wished to avoid, and his very name it was punishment to him to pronounce. He had done all this for a, go a girl whom he could neither regard nor esteem. Her heart did not whisper that he had done it for her. Sorry, her heart did whisper that he had done it for her, but it was a hope shortly checked by other considerations she soon felt that even her vanity was insufficient and when required to depend on his affection for her for a woman who had already refused him as able to overcome a sentiment so natural as abhorrence against relationship with Wickham brother-in-law of Wickham every kind of pride must revolt from the connection he had to be sure done much she was ashamed to think how much he had given a reason for his interference which asked no extraordinary stretch of belief. It was reasonable that he should feel he had been wrong. He had liberty, sorry, he had liberality and he had the means of exercising it. And though she would not place herself as his principal inducement, she could perhaps believe that remaining partiality for her might assist his endeavours in a cause where her peace of mind must be materially concerned. It was painful, exceedingly painful 
to know that they were under obligations to a person who could never receive a return. They owed the restoration of Lydia, her character, everything, to him. Oh, how heartily did she grieve over every ungracious sensation she had ever encouraged, every saucy speech she had ever directed towards him. For herself she was humbled, but she was proud of him, proud that in a cause of compassion and honour he had been able to get the better of himself. She read over her aunt's commendation of him again and again. It was hardly enough, but it pleased her. She was even sensible of some pleasure, though mixed with regret, of finding how steadfastly both she and her uncle had been persuaded that affection and confidence subsisted between Mr. Darcy and herself. She was roused from her seat and her reflections by someone's approach, and before she could strike into another path, she was overtaken by Wickham. I am afraid I interrupt your solitary ramble, my dear sister, said he, as he joined her. You certainly do, she replied with a smile, but it does not follow that the interruption must be unwelcome. I should be sorry indeed if it were. We were always good friends, and now we are better. True, are the others coming out? I do not know. Mrs. Bennet and Lydia are going in the carriage to Meryton, and so, my dear sister, I find from my uncle and aunt that you have actually seen Pemberley. She replied in the affirmative. I almost envy you to the pleasure, and yet I believe it would be too much for me, or else I could take it in my way to Newcastle. And you saw the old housekeeper, I suppose, poor Reynolds. She was always very fond of me, but of course she did not mention my name to you. Yes, she did. And what did she say? That you were gone into the army and she was, af she was afraid had not turned out well. For such a distance as that, you know, things are strangely misrepresented. Certainly, he replied, biting his lips. Elizabeth hoped she had silenced him, but, he's, but he soon afterwards said, I was surprised to see Darcy in town last month. We passed each other several times. I wonder what he can be doing there. Perhaps repairing for the marriage with Mr. Burr, said Elizabeth. It must be something particular to take him there at this time of year. Undoubtedly. Did you see him while we were at Lampton? I thought I understood from the gardeners that you had. Yes, he introduced us to his sister. And do you like her? Very much. I've heard indeed that she is uncommonly improved within this year or two. When I last saw her, she was not very promising. I'm very glad you liked her. I hope she will turn out well. I dare say she will. She has got over the most trying age. Did you go by the village of Kimpton? I do not recollect that we did. I mention it because it was the living which I ought to have had. The most delightful place. Excellent parsonage house. It would have suited me in every respect. How should you have liked making sermons? Exceedingly well. I should have considered it as part of my duty, and the exertion would soon have been nothing. One ought not to repine, but to be sure it would have been such a thing for me. The quiet, the retirement of such life would have answered all my ideas of happiness, if it was not to be. Did you ever hear Darcy mention the circumstances? Sorry, the circumstance when you were in Kent? I have heard from authority, which I thought was good, though it was left to you conditionally only and at the will of the present patron. You have, yes, there was something in that. I told you so from the first, you may remember. I did hear, too. There was a time when sermon making was not so palatable to you as it seems to be at present, that you actually declared your resolution of never taking orders, and that the business had been compromised accordingly. You did, and it's not wholly without foundation. You may remember that I told you on that point when we first talked of it. They were now almost at the door of the house for she had walked fast to get rid of him, and unwilling for her sister's sake to provoke him, she only said in reply with a good-humoured smile, Come, Mr. Rick Wickham, we are brother and sister, you know. Do not let us quarrel about the past. In future, I hope you shall be always of one mind. She held out her hand. He kissed it with affectionate gallantry, though he hardly knew how to look, and they entered the house. So, some interesting developments there. Mr. Wickham um, has... Uh, oh, what's the word? As charming as ever. Chapter 53 Mr. Wickham was so perfectly satisfied with this conversation that he never again distressed himself provoked his dear sister Elizabeth by introducing the subject of it, and she was pleased to find that she had said enough to keep him quiet. 
The day of his and Libby's departure soon came, and Mrs. Bennet was forced to submit to a separation which, as her husband by no means entered into her scheme of their all going to Newcastle, was likely to continue at least a twelvemonth. Oh, my dear Lydia, she cried, when shall we meet again? Oh, Lord, I don't know. Not these two or three years, perhaps. Write to me very often, my dear, as often as I can. But you know married women have never much time for writing. My sisters may write to me. they will have nothing else to do. Mr. Wickens' adieus were much more affectionate than his wife's. He smiled, looked handsome, and said many pretty things. He is a, f he is a fine... A f <clears throat> He is as fine a fellow, said Mr. Bennet, as soon as they were out of the house, as ever I saw. He simpers and smirks and makes love to us all. I am prodigiously proud of him. I defy even Sir William Lucas himself to produce a more valuable son-in-law. The loss of a daughter made Mrs. Bennet very dull for several days. I often think, said she, that there is nothing so bad as parting with one's friends. One seems so forlorn without them. This is the consequence, you see, madame, of marrying a daughter, said Elizabeth. It must make you better satisfied that you're ever four or single. It is no such thing. Lydia does not leave me because she is married, but only because her husband's regiment happens to be so far off. If that had been nearer, she would not have gone so soon. She... If that had been nearer, she would not have gone so soon. But the spiritless condition which this event threw her into was shortly relieved. As her mind opened again to the agitation of hope by an article of news which they then began which then began to be in circulation. The housekeeper at Neverfield had received orders to prepare for the arrival of her master, who was coming down in a day or two to shoot there for several weeks. Mrs. Bennet was quite in the fidgets. She looked at Jane and smiled and shook her head by turns. Well, well, and so Mr. Bingley is coming down, sister. For Mrs. Phillips first brought her the news. Well, so much the better. Not that I care about it, though. He is nothing to us, you know, and I'm sure I never want to see him again. But, however, he is very welcome to come to Neverfield if he likes it. And who knows what may happen. But that is nothing to us, you know, sister. We agreed long ago never to mention a word about it, and so it is quite certain he is coming. Oh, and so, is it quite certain he is coming? You may depend on it, replied the other. For Mrs. Nichols was in Meryton last night. I saw her passing by. I went out myself on purpose to know the truth of it, and she told me that it was certain that it was certain true. He comes down on Thursday at the latest, very likely on Wednesday. She was going to the butcher's, she told me, on purpose to order in some meat on Wednesday, and she has got three couples of ducks just to fit to be killed. Three couple of ducks just fit to be killed. Hmm. Miss Bennet had not been able to hear of his coming without changing colour. It was many months since she had mentioned his name to Elizabeth, but now, as they were alone together, she said, I saw you look at me today, Lizzie, when my aunt told us of the present report, and I know I appear distressed, but don't imagine it was from any silly cause. I was only confused for the moment, because I felt that I should be looked at. I do assure you that the news does not affect me either with pleasure or pain. I'm glad of one thing, that he comes alone, because we shall see the less of him. Not that I am afraid of myself, but I dread other people's remarks. Elizabeth did not know what to make of it. Had she not seen him in Derbyshire? She might have supposed him capable of coming there with no other view than what was acknowledged. But she still thought him partial to Jane, and she wavered as to the greater probability of his coming there with his friend's permission, or being bold enough to come without it. Yet it is hard, she sometimes thought, that this poor man cannot come to a house which he, is legally, which he has legally hired without raising all this speculation. I will leave him to himself. In spite of what her sister declared, and really believed to be her feelings and the expectation of his arrival, Elizabeth could easily perceive that her spirits were affected by it. They were more, dis they were more disturbed, more unequal, than she had often seen them. The subject which had so warmly uh, canvassed between their parents about a twelve month ago was now brought forward again. As soon as ever Mr. Bingley comes, my dear, said Mrs. Bennet, you will wait on him, of course. No, no, you forced me into visiting him last year, and promised if I went to see him, 
He should marry one of my daughters, but it ended in nothing. I will not be sent on this, on a fool's errand. His wife re represented to him how absolutely necessary such an attention would be from all the neighbouring gentlemen on his returning to Neverfield. It is an etiquette I despise, said he. If he wants a society, let him seek it. He knows where we live. I will not spend my hours in running after my neighbours every time they go away and come back again. Well, all I know is that it will be abom ab abominably rude if you do not wait on him. But, however, that shan't prevent my asking him to dine here. I am determined. We must have Mrs. Long and the Goldings soon. They will make thirteen of ourselves, so there will be just room at the table for him. Consoled by his resolution, she was better able to bear her husband's incivility, though it was very mortifying to know that her neighbours might all see Mr. Bingley in consequence of it before they did. At the at the day of his arrival, drew, as the day of his arrival drew near. I begin to be sorry that he comes at all, said Jane to her sister. It would be nothing. I, I could see him with perfect indifference, but I can hardly bear to hear it thus perpetually talked of. My mother means well, but she does not know. No one can know how much I suffer from what she says. Happy shall I be when his stay at Neverfield is over. I wish I could say anything to comfort you, replied Elizabeth, but it is wholly out of my power. You must feel it, and the usual satisfaction of preaching patience to a sufferer is denied me, because you have always so much. Mr. Bingley arrived. Mrs. Bennet, through the assistance of servants, contrived to have the earliest tidings of it, that the period of anxiety and fretfulness on her side might be as long as it could. She counted the days that must intervene before their invitation could be sent, hopeless of seeing him before. But on the third morning after his arrival in Hertfordshire, she saw him, from her dressing room window, enter the paddock and ride towards the house. Her daughters were eagerly called to partake of her joy. Jane resolutely kept her place at the table, but Elizabeth, to satisfy her mother, went to the window. She looked. She saw Mr. Darcy with him, and sat down again by her sister. "'There is a gentleman with him, Mamma," said Kitty. "'Who can it be?' "'Some acquaintance or other, my dear, I suppose. I'm sure I do not know.' La replied Kitty, it looks just like that man that used to be with him before, Mr. What's-his-name, that tall, proud man. Good gracious, Mr. Darcy, and so it does, I vow. Well, any friend of Mr. Bing Bingley's will always be welcome here, to be sure, but else I must say that I hate the very sight of him. Jane looked at Elizabeth with surprise and concern. She knew but little of their meeting in Derbyshire, and therefore felt for the awkwardness which must attend her sister in seeing him almost for the first time after receiving his explanatory letter. After receiving his explanatory letter. Yes, that was the letter she received when she was in... Oh, what's it called? When they were... When they were visiting... Their cousins. in Hunsford, Parsonage in Hunsford, and they were regularly going up uh, to Lady Catherine's house, which was Rosings, because of course Mr. Darcy and Colonel Fitzwilliam, I think it was, came to visit um, Lady Catherine. Yes. So it was during that period that Mr. Darcy gave an explanatory letter to Elizabeth explaining both the his history with Mr. Wickham, which was the first time Elizabeth became uh, truly aware of 
who and what Mr. Wickham was. Really. And what was the other thing he... Oh, and Mr. Darcy also gave an explanation as to why he contrived to separate Jane and Mr. Bingley. So that would be the letter that Jane's referring to. Um, she knew but little of their meeting in Derbyshire and therefore felt for the awkwardness which must attend her sister in seeing him almost for the first time after receiving his explanatory letter. Both sisters were uncomfortable enough, each felt for the other, and of course for themselves, and their mother talked on of her dislike of Mr. Darcy, and a resolution to be civil to him only as Mr. Bingley's friend, without being heard by either of them. But Elizabeth had sources of uneasiness which could not be suspected by Jane, to whom she had never yet had courage to uh, shoe, well, I think that's an older spelling of, sh or an older form of show, Mr. Gardner's letter or to relate her own change of sentiment towards him. To Jane, he could only be a man whose proposal she had refused and whose merit she had undervalued. But to her own more extensive information, he was the person to whom the whole family were indebted for the first of benefits, and whom she regarded as help with an interest, if not quite so tender, at least as reasonable and just as what Jane felt for Bingley. Her astonishment at his coming, at his coming to Neverfield, to Longbourn, and voluntarily seeking her again was almost equal to what she had known on first witnessing his altered behaviour in Derbyshire. The colour which had been driven from her face returned for half a minute with an additional glow, and a smile of, de and a smile of delight added lustre to her eyes as she thought for that space of time that his affection and wishes must still be unshaken, but she would not be secure. Let me first see how he behaves, said she, it will then be early enough for expectation. She sat intently at work, striving to be composed and without daring to lift up her eyes, till anxious curiosity carried them to the face of her sister. As the servant was approaching the door, Jane looked a little paler than usual, but more sedate than Elizabeth had expected. On the gentleman's appearing, her colour increased, yet she received them with tolerable ease, and with a propriety of behaviour equally free from any symptom of resentment or any unnecessary complacence. Elizabeth Elizabeth said as little to Eva as civility would allow, and sat down again to her work with an eagerness which did not, which it did not often command. She had ventured only one glance at Darcy. He looked serious as useful, and, she thought, more as he had been used to look in Hertfordshire than, he had, uh, than she had seen him at Pemberley. But perhaps he could not in her mother's presence be what he was before her uncle and aunt. It was a painful but not an improbable conjecture. Bingley, she had likewise seen for an instant, and in that short period saw him looking both pleased and embarrassed. He was received by Mrs. Bennet with a degree of civility which made her two daughters ashamed, especially when contrasted with the cold and ceremonious politeness of her curtsy and address to his friend. I'm not sure I follow that. He was received, so that being Mr. Bingley, by Mrs. Bennet with a degree of civility which made her two daughters, presumably Jane and Elizabeth, ashamed, especially when contrasted with the cold and, c and ceremonious politeness of her curtsy and address to his friend. But it was Mrs. Bennet's civility that was the topic under discussion, so... I'm not sure how it could contrast with itself. That doesn't figure but to me, but perhaps I'm missing something. Elizabeth, particularly, who knew that her mother owed to the latter the preservation of her favourite daughter from irredeemable infamy, was hurt and distressed to a most painful degree by a distinctive a distinction so ill applied. Darcy, after inquiring of her how Mr. and Mrs. Gardner did, a question which she could not answer without confusion, said scarcely anything. He was not seated by her, perhaps that was the reason of his silence, but it had not been so in Derbyshire. There he had talked to her friends, uh, when he could not to herself. 
but now several minutes elapsed without bringing the sound of his voice, and when occasionally unable to resist the impulse of curiosity, she raised her eyes to his face. She has often found him looking at Jane as at herself, and frequently no object but the ground. More thoughtfulness and less anxiety to please than when they last met were plainly expressed. She was disappointed and angry with herself for being so. Could I expect it to be otherwise, said she? Yet why not did he come? Sorry, yet why did he come? She was in no humour for conversation with anyone but himself. And to him she had hardly courage to speak. She inquired after his sister but could do no more. It is a long time, Mr Bingley, since you went away, said Mrs Bennet. You readily agreed to it. I begin to be afraid you never come back again. People did say you meant to quit the place entirely at Michaelmas. But, however, I hope it is not true. A great many changes have happened in the neighbourhood since you went away. Miss Lucas is married and settled, and one of my own daughters. I suppose you've heard of it. Indeed, you must have seen it in the papers. It was in the Times and the Carrier. I know, though it is not put... <laughs> Though it was not put in as it ought to be, it was only said lately George Wickham Esquire to Miss Lydia Bennet, without there being a syllable said of her father, or the place where she lived, or anything. It was my brother Gardner's drawing up too, and I wonder how he came to make such an awkward business of it. Did you see it? Bingley replied that he did, and made his congratulations. El Elizabeth dared not lift up her eyes. How Mr Darcy looked, therefore, she could not tell. It is a delightful thing, to be sure, of a daughter well married, continued her mother, but at the same time, Mr. Bingley, it was very hard to have her taken such away from me. They had gone down to Newcastle, a place quite northward it seems, and there they are to stay, and there they are to stay, I do not know how long. His regiment is there, for I suppose you have heard of his leaving the dash dash shire, and of his being gone into the regulars. Thank heaven, he has some friends, though perhaps not so many as he deserves. Elizabeth, who knew this to be levelled at Mr. Darcy, was in such a misery of shame that she could hardly keep her seat. It drew, her fr it drew from her, however, the exertion of speaking, which nothing else had so effect effectually done before. And she asked Bingley whether he meant to make any stay in the country at present. A few weeks, he believed. When you have killed all your own birds, Mr. Bingley, said her mother, I beg you will come here and shoot as many as you please on Mr. Bennet's manor. I am sure you'll be vastly happy to oblige you. I'm sorry, I'm sure he will be vastly happy to oblige you, and will save all the best for the of the cubbies for you. Cubbies? A group of eight to twelve or more quail, a brood of partridges, grouse, etc. A party or group of persons or things. Hmm. Uh, so I imagine that's a brood of partridges or grouse. It's a Elizabeth misery increased at such a necessary, such officious attention. Will the same pair, with the same fair prospect to arise at present as had flattered them a year ago, everything she was persuaded would be hastening to the same vexatious conclusion. At that instant she felt that years of happiness could not make Jane or herself amends for moments of such painful confusion. Uh, let me read that again. Elizabeth misery increased at such unnecessary, such officious attention. Were the same fair prospect to arise at present as had flattered them a year ago? Everything she was persuaded would be hastening to the same vexatious confu conclusion. Well, the same fair prospect to rise at present as had flattered them a year ago. So, what was the prospect that flattered them a year ago? I think that was just them moving in, wasn't it? Mr. Bingley moving in uh, to.
never failed. Yeah, that must have been a year ago. I don't think they could be referring to anything else. Perhaps the ball? Uh. Oh, perhaps the vexatious conclusion is where Mr. Darcy was alienated by the commonness of the Bennett family. I'm not sure, I'm guessing. At that instant, she felt that years of happiness could not make Jane or herself amends for moments of such painful confusion. So is that saying, even if they were together, the pairs were married and together for years of happiness, it would not be enough to compensate for the painful confusion the gentleman must be in right now? I'm not sure. I feel like I'm misinterpreting this whole paragraph. The first wish of my heart, said she to herself, is never more to be in company with either of them. The society can afford no pleasure that will atone for such wretchedness as this. Let me never see either one of, either one or the other again. Oh, that's interesting. So she's saying that the situation is so awfully awkward that she can't bear it and that it even overshadows the potential happiness they could have together in the future. Interesting. Yet the misery for which years of happiness were to offer no compensation received soon afterwards material relief from observing how much the beauty of her sister rekindled the admiration of her former lover. When the first he came in, he had spoken to her but little, but every five minutes seemed to be giving her more of his attention. He found her as handsome as she had been last year, as good-natured and as unaffected, though not quite so chatty. Jane was anxious that no difference should be perceived in her at all, and was really persuaded that she talked as much as ever. But her mind was so busily engaged that she did not always know when she was silent. When the gentleman rose to go away, Mrs. Bennet was mindful of her intended civility, and they were invited and engaged to dine at Longbourn in a few days' time. You're quite, you're quite a visit in my debt, Mr. Bingley, she added. For when you went uh, to town last winter, meaning London, you promised to take a family dinner with us as soon as you returned. I've not forgotten you. I've not forgot you, see, and I assure you, I am very much, I am very much disappointed that you did not come back and keep your engagement. Bingley looked a little silly at this reflection and said something of his concern at having been prevented by business. They then went away. Mrs. Bennet had been strongly inclined to ask them to stay and dine there that day, but though she always kept a, good ta a very good table, she did not think anything less than two courses could be good enough for a man on whom she had such anxious designs, or satisfy the appetite and pride of one who had, who had ten thousand a year. So that must be Mr. Darcy, that was 10000 a year. Which then brings into stark reality the fact that he had paid, I think they were estimating about 3000 to um, arrange the... I think they'd concluded, that I think the gardeners had estimated that Mr. Darcy must have been about £3,000 out of pocket for having sorted out the Lydia and Wickham situation. I think that's what they concluded in the letter. I could be misremembering. So that's almost a third of his yearly earnings. Well, income. As soon as they were gone, Elizabeth walked out to recover her spirits, or in other words, to dwell without interruption on those subjects that must deadened them more. Mr. Darcy's behaviour astonished and vexed her. Why, if he came only to be silent, grave and indifferent, said she, did he come at all? She could settle it no way that gave her pleasure. No way that gave her pleasure. 
he could still he could be still amiable, still pleasing to my uncle and aunt when he was in town. And why not to me? If he fears me, why not come hither? Well, sorry, if he fears me, why come hi hither? If he no longer cares for me, why silent? Teasing, teasing man. I will think no more about him. A resolution was for a short time involuntarily kept for the approach of his, her sister, who joined her with a cheerful look which showed her better satisfied with their visitors than Elizabeth. Now, said she, that this first meeting is over, I feel perfectly easy. I know my own strength and I shall never be embarrassed again by his coming. I am glad he dines here on Tuesday. I'll then be publicly seen that, on both sides, we meet only as common and indifferent acquaintances. Oh, sorry. We meet only as common and indifferent acquaintance. Yes, very indifferent indeed, said Elizabeth, laughingly. Oh, Jane, take care. My dear Lizzie, you cannot think me so weak as to be in danger now. I think you are in very great danger of making him as much in love with you as ever. They did not see the gentleman again till Tuesday, and Mrs. Bennet, in the meanwhile, was giving way to all the happy schemes which the good humour and common politeness of Bingley, in half an hour's visit, had revived. On Tuesday there was a large party assembled at Longbourn, and the two who were most anxiously expected, to the credit of their punctuality as sportsmen, were in very good time. When they repaired to the dining room, Elizabeth eagerly watched to see whether Bingley would take the place, which, in all their former parties, had belonged to him, by her sister. Her prudent mother, occupied, the same, occupied by the same ideas, forbore to invite him to sit by herself. On entering the room, he seemed to hesitate, but Jane happened to look round and happened to smile. It was decided he placed himself by her. Elizabeth, with a triumphant sensation, looked towards his friend, who bore it with a noble indifference, and she would have imagined that Bingley had received his sanction to be happy, had she not seen his eyes likewise turn toward Mr. Darcy with an expression of half-laughing alarm. His behaviour to her sister was such, during dinner time, as showed an admiration of her, which, though more guarded than formerly, persuaded Elizabeth that if left wholly to himself, Jane's happiness and his own would be speedily secured. Though she dared not depend upon the consequence, she yet received pleasure from observing his behaviour. It gave her all the animation that her spirits could boast, for she was in no cheerful humour. Mr. Darcy was almost as far from her as the table could divide them. He was on the other. He was on one side of her mother. She knew how little such a situation could give pleasure to Eva or make Eva appear to advantage. She was not near enough to hear any of their discourse, but she could see how seldom they spoke to each other and how formal and cold was their manner whenever they did. Her mother ungracious and graciousness made the sense of what they owed him more painful to Elizabeth's mind, and she would at times have given anything to be privileged to help to tell him that his kindness was neither unknown nor unfelt by the whole of the family. She was in hopes that the evening would afford some opportunity of bringing them together, that the whole of the visit would not pass away without enabling them to enter into something more of conversation than the mere ceremonious salutation attending his entrance. Anxious and uneasy, the period which passed in the drawing room before the, gent before the gentleman came was wearisome and dull to a degree that almost made her uncivil. She looked forward to that entrance as the point on which all her chance of pleasure for the evening must depend. If he does not come to me, then, said she, I shall give him up forever. The gentleman came, and she thought he looked as if he would have answered her hopes. But alas, the ladies had crowded round the table, where Miss Bennet was making tea, and Elizabeth pouring out the coffee in so close a confederacy that there was not a single vacancy near her which would admit of a chair, 
and on the gentleman's approaching, one of the girls closer to her than ever, one of the girls moved closer to her than ever and said in a whisper, The men shan't come and part us. I'm determined. We want none of them, do we? Darcy had walked away to another part of the room. She followed him with her eyes, envied everyone to whom he spoke, had scarcely patience enough to help anybody to coffee, and then and then was enraged against herself for being so silly. A man who has once been refused, how could I ever be foolish enough to expect a renewal of his love? Is that if there is one among the sex who would not protest against such a weakness as a second proposal to the same woman? There is no indignity so abhorrent to their feelings. She was a little revived, however, by his bringing back his coffee cup himself, and she seized the opportunity of saying, Is your sister at Pemberley still? Yes, she will remain there till Christmas, and quite alone, have all her friends left her. Mrs. Ainsley is with her. The others have been uh, gone on to Scarborough these three weeks. She could think of nothing more to say, but if she wished to converse but if he wished to converse with her, he might have better success. He stood by her, however, for some minutes in silence, and at last on the young lady's whispering to Elizabeth again, he walked away. When the tea things were removed, in the card table's place, the ladies all rose, and Elizabeth was then hoping to, uh, to be soon joined by him, when all her views were overthrown by seeing him fall a victim to her mother's uh, rapacity for whist players. Rapacity. The quality of being rapacious, veracity. Uh, voracious, avaricious, uh, given to uh, taking by force or plundering, aggressively greedy. Um, where was that? Elizabeth was then hoping to be soon joined by him, and when all her views were overthrown by seeing him fall a victim to her mother's rapacity for whist players, and in a few moments they proceeded with the rest of the party, she now lost every ex expectation of pleasure. They were confined for the evening at different tables, and she had nothing to hope, but that his eyes were so often turned towards the side of the room as to make him play as unsuccessfully as herself. Mrs. Bennet had designed to keep the two Neverfield gentlemen to supper, but their carriage was unluckily ordered before any of the others, and she had no opportunity of detaining them. Well, girls, said she, as soon as they were left to themselves, what say you to the day? I think everything has passed off uncommonly well, I, I assure you. The dinner was as well dressed as I ever, <laughs> as any I ever saw. The venison was roasted to a turn, and everybody said that they never saw so fat a haunch. The soup was fifty times better than what we had at the Lucas's last week, and even Mr. Darcy acknowledged that the partridges were remarkably well done, and I suppose he has two or three French cooks at least. And my dear Jane, I never saw you look in greater beauty. Mrs. Long said so too, for I asked her whether you did not. And what do you think she said besides? Ah, Mrs. Bennet, we shall have her at Neverfield at last. She did indeed. I do think Mrs. Long is, go is as good a creature as ever lived and her nieces are very pretty behaved girls, and not at all handsome. I like them prodigiously. <laughs> and not at all handsome presumably means they aren't a threat to her daughter's marriage opportunities. Mrs. Bennet, in short, was in very great spirit. She had seen enough of Bingley's behaviour to Jane to be convinced that she would get him at last, and her expectations of advantage to her family, when in a happy humour, were so far beyond reason that she was quite disappointed at not seeing him there again the next day to make his proposals. It has been a very agreeable day, said Miss Bennet to Elizabeth. The party seems so well selected, so suitable one with the other. I hope we may often meet again. Elizabeth smiled. Lizzie, you must not do so. You must not suspect me. It mortifies me. I assure you that I have not learnt to enjoy his conversation as agreeably and sensible <clears throat> sorry, I assure you that I have now learnt 
enjoy his conversation as an agreeable and sensible young man without having a wish beyond it. I'm perfectly satisfied from what his manners now are, that he had never any design of engaging my affection. It is only that he is blessed with greater sweetness of address and a stronger desire of generally pleasing than any other man. You are very cruel, said her sister. You will not let me smile and are provoking me to every moment. Uh, and are provoking me to it every moment. How hard it is in some cases to be believed, and how impossible in others. But why should you wish to persuade me that I feel more than I acknowledge? This is a question which I hardly know how to answer. We all love to instruct, though we can teach only what is not worth knowing. Forgive me, and if you persist in indifference, do not make me your confidant. So, interesting. So, we will finish this stream as usual by looking at some riddles. So I believe the last riddle we looked at last week was 84. Over all the world my empire I extend, and while that lasts, my reign can never end. I flatter all and almost all deceive. Yet when I promise next, they still believe. To heaven I lead, but must not enter there. In hell I cannot be, earth is my sphere. If still in vain you puzzle for my name, search your own breast, for there I surely am. And I believe the solution to that one was hope. Indeed it was. So, 85. Though but small my size and figure, yet I am in general use. To every blessing I contribute, to all happiness conduce. No delight exists without me, I attend every bow and bell. Also grace the shepherd's cottage, and the hermit's lonely cell. From our gracious king I'm banished, in his court I'm never seen. But I with redoubled duty, daily wait upon the queen. I belong to men of learning, well with genius, taste and sense. Yet to every simple blockhead, I my friendly aid dispense. I promote the noblest feelings, and from virtue never remove, or never in a passion, but I always am in love. I partake of each amusement, and of pleasure have my share, yet I am oft observed in trouble, and can never fly from care. Stranger to malicious bosoms, gentle breasts may influence find, yet though in your heart you place me, I am never in your mind. I am ever in amazement, Deal in wonder and surprise, never in your sight appearing, yet I'm here before your eyes. Hopefully that's still legible.
Jenny says, dwell with genius. Oh, sorry. Jenny says, it says, no delight exists without me. Does it mean the word delight itself? Or something else? Dwell with genius, taste, and sense. What is the common feature shared by these three words? Uh, I will just... Before I address that, I will just say, I was considering whether the answer could be beauty. Um, so those words... Uh, all of those words contain the letter E. Delight, genius, taste, and sense. Attend every bow and bell. It is the letter E, isn't it? <laughs> I with free double duty daily wait upon the queen. Queen has two E's. The the answer is the letter E, isn't it? Not in a passion, yeah. Always in, in love. Always am in love. to malicious bosoms gentle breasts my influence find in heart but not in mind it's the letter E never in your sight appearing but I'm here before your eyes yeah it's the letter E Yes, those three words, genius, taste, and sense, also all contain the letter S, but the word delight doesn't. Um, but I must thank you, Jenny, because... Uh, hold on, let me zoom in again. Uh, you got me thinking along the right lines. It's the one thing I always forget to do. I always forget to check for letter-based answers do these riddles and once you got me thinking about the words it was obvious the letter E yep. thank you Jenny Um, 86. I'm a cold, insipid creature, and to feeling have no claim, yet to soft impressions yielding, warmed by a resistant, by a resistless flame. Changing then my shape and features, different faces I display, under various forms appearing, fancies dictates I obey. Sometimes decked with princely honours, crowns and coronets I wear, sometimes graced with holy metres, yet full often arms I bear. Though my words are few in number, they're with sentiment replete, often philosophic language, moral lessons I repeat. I assist in marriage contracts when all parties are agreed, never my friendly aid refusing, useful both in will and deed.
Ginny says it's a creature, so it is alive. Not necessarily. They may be using creature in a more poetic sense. I'm wondering if it's something along the lines of an inscription in stone, although that doesn't fully figure, or a sculpture. Yet to soft impressions yielding, that would make sense, worn by a resistless flame, which doesn't. Changing then my shape and features, different faces I display, that would make sense. Under various forms appearing, fancy dictates I obey. Again, sometimes decks with princely honours, crowns and coronets I wear, sometimes grace with holy metres, yet full often arms I bear. Again, that all figures. Though my words are few in number, they are with sentiment replete, often philosophic language, moral lessons I repeat. Again, that would all figure. I assist in marriage contracts when all parties are agreed. I don't follow. How? Oh, I don't see how that would make sense. Never my friendly aid refusing, useful both in will and deed. And again... That doesn't quite figure. Jenny suggests, together with our assisted marriage contract, a flower. I mean, flowers that appear on wedding ceremonies. I don't think so. That wouldn't explain, for example, warmed by a resistless flame. Wax. The answer is wax. Specifically wax which has been imprinted with a seal. I'm a cold and insipid creature, and to feeling have no claim, yet to soft impressions yielding, like wax, warmed by a resistless flame. So you heat it up, and it melts. 
Changing then my shape and features, different faces I display, yes. Because you you um push a seal up against it. Under various forms appearing, fancy dictates I obey. Sorry, fancies dictate Fancies dictates I obey. Sometimes decked with princely honours, crowns and coronets I wear, sometimes grossed with holy meters, yet full often arms I bear. Again, that all figures. Though my words are few in number, they're with sentiment replete, often philosophic language, moral lessons I repeat. I don't know much about seals, but it th fully makes sense to me that they would have a few words around them in the same way that, for example, coins often have a few words uh, around the outside, or... Um, <laughs> similar... Um, designs as that you know it's very common to have a motto on an insignia so that would figure I assist in marriage contracts when all parties are agreed I don't know if marriage contracts were signed and sealed but that makes sense um, or at the very least to put a seal upon it to put one's insignia on it never my friendly aid refusing useful both in will and deed that all figures I think the answer is wax. Ceiling wax. Insipid. An appetizingly flavorless, flat lacking character definition. It means, or, or it means tasteless, coming from not savory. Interesting. Oh, thank you, Jenny. I'm not sure it's so much more practice as, as luck and perhaps how awake I am right 87 with monks and with hermits I chiefly reside from camps and from courts at a distance the ladies say some say can't my presence abide but to banish me join their assistance I seldom can flatter, though oft show respect, to the patriot, the preacher, the peer. But sometimes, alas, a sad mark of neglect, I am proof of contempt and a sneer. I once, as the chief of our poet's record, was pleased with the nightingale's song. Yet such my strange taste, I leave lady and lord, and oft wander with thieves all night long. By the couch of the sick I'm frequently found, and always attend on the dead. With patient affection I sit on the ground. When talked of tis found I'm fled.
Jenny says, so this thing is associated with religious people and those who are dead. What is the common between these two groups of people? Being alone? With monks and with hermits, I chiefly reside from camps and from other courts at distance. That makes sense. Monks and hermits would spend a lot of time solitary on their own, hermits especially, from camps and from courts at distance. So, not at camps or at courts, which again makes sense. The ladies, some say, can't my presence abide, but to banish me, join their assistance. So, by joining them, you are banishing being alone. I seldom can flatter, though often show respect to the patriot, the preacher, the peer. Again, that figures, but a lot. But sometimes, alas, a sad mark of neglect and proof of contempt and a sneer. Again, that makes sense. Leaving someone out, excluding them. I once, as the chief of our poet's record, was pleased with the nightingale's song. I'm not sure what that's a reference to. Um... I just want to check the date when this was published. Eighteen oh six. Okay, there's absolutely no chance that that's a reference to Ode to a Nightingale, then, because that was written in eighteen nineteen by John Keats, of course, as we have seen. Um, uh, during the poetry section of our streams. Uh, so yeah, what it says. I once, as the chief of our poet's record, was pleased with the Nightingale's song. I don't think that, uh, I, I, do, I suspect that's a reference to something that I just don't know. Perhaps it's a reference to Shakespeare? Not sure. Yet such a, such, yet such my strange taste, I leave lady and lord and off wander with thieves all night long. That sort of makes sense, being solitary, being alone. By the coach of the sick I'm frequently found, and I always attend on the dead. That makes sense. With patient affection, I sit on the ground, and when talked of, tis found I'm fled. Yes, because if you're talking, there must be more than one person. So it's being alone. It's being solitary. Silence. With monks and with hermits, I chiefly reside from camps and from courts at a distance. The ladies some say can my presence abide to banish me, join their assistance. I seldom can flatter, though oft show respect to the patriot, the preacher, the peer. But sometimes, alas, a sad mark of neglect and proof of contempt and a sneer. I once, as the chief of our poet's record, was pleased with the nightingale's song. Yet, uh, yet such my strange taste, I leave lady and lord, and oft wander with thieves all night long. By the coach of the sick I am frequently found, and always attend on the dead. With patient affection I sit on the ground, but when talked of tis found I am fled. Jenny said very close, isn't it, being alone versus silence. It was a very similar idea. 
I wonder if it was this line. I once, as the chief of our poet's record, was pleased with the Nightingale's song. I wonder if that was the clue that was supposed to just um, give it away. Because if this is a reference to some sort of... Uh, some line in Shakespeare or something like that, where silence somehow was pleased with a Nightingale's song, that would make sense. Jenny said, no, it should not be alone because of the thieves, because it because of the term thieves. Well, except that it says, I oft wander with thieves all night long. Does that mean a group of thieves, or does that mean thieves plural, who are individually alone, you know, in different parts of the country? But I do take your point. Um, oh, well. Still, that's two out of three. So, thank you for coming everyone. I hope you enjoyed the stream. I, my streaming this week is a little disrupted and changed. I will be streaming tomorrow, in, that is Thursday, instead of Friday and Saturday. Usually I would have a Friday stream and very often I have a Saturday stream. I'll be seeing my grandparents over that period so those streams are cancelled. To make up for that, I'll be doing a Thursday stream tomorrow uh, instead. And I will be continuing Rhythm, sorry, Riven, the sequel to Mist in that stream. Uh, and then come Monday, my streaming will be back to normal. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Um, where Monday will also be Riven. So once again, uh, thank you for coming everyone. I hope you had a good time and good night.